Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to speak to you today, and I'm going to try and touch on a wide variety of topics. You know, as such, I might only go an inch deep on a wide range of ideas, but I'm especially interested in your feedback and questions. The most important thing to take away from this talk is to critically think about how we look at the software we're making and all the various dependencies it has. And so you should start that critical thinking by thinking critically about my presentation. I'd love your feedback, questions, challenges, and ideas to come either as I'm presenting or after the talk. And first today, I wanna to talk about a story, a story that's not new to our modern world, a story that has been a critical part underlying human society for, well, probably for as long as humans have had a society to speak of. Today, we might call that supply chain or logistics or infrastructure. Whatever you call it, as long as humans have organized themselves and you know, created specializations, and then as long as we've had adversarial relationships with other humans, there have been what we would call today supply chain attacks. Many wars have been fought and won based on the basis solely of the ability of one side or the other to control or master their supply chain or that of their adversaries. In fact, in The Art of War, Sun Tzu writes, the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. And in the technological age, the age where software has eaten the world, software is just reliant on supply chains as any other part of our human infrastructure. And software can be eaten by its own supply chain. My name is Brendan O'Leary, and I'm talking to you today from the East Coast of the United States, just a few miles outside of Washington, DC. I'm glad we can be together remotely. It's something that I'm maybe a little bit more familiar with than, than others. Since I've been at GitLab since 2017, and GitLab is a completely all remote company and always has been, with over 1,300 team members in 65 different countries and regions, and we have exactly zero offices. I'm currently working as a developer evangelist for GitLab, but I've had a lot of roles over my time here. I spent time building up a professional services organization to help our customers implement GitLab and DevOps best practices. And then for a time, I helped run our CI product, GitLab CI CD, as a product manager. And before GitLab, I spent a decade in healthcare software and development and some time as a contractor, the US Special Operations Command. In all these years of software experience, in very different environments, one thing has remained constant. The ever-growing list of dependencies that the software I was helping to build has to have in order to function correctly. And every once in a while, one of those dependencies goes terribly wrong. And that's exactly what happened in the SolarWinds hack, which has been such a focus in our industry for the past year. In fact, the hack itself wasn't a single event. It was a sophisticated, coordinated, focused attack that took months to execute. And it wasn't conducted against the main targets. SolarWinds in this case was part of a supply chain for the real targets, high profile companies and US government agencies. The attackers intentionally sought out the weakest links in the supply chain of their targets. Instead of attacking head on or through some sort of inflammatory attack aimed directly at their adversary, the attackers chose to hide in plain sight blend in with the other software deployed, and then slowly exploit that point of entry for their real goals. And as we said, this attack method, just as any supply chain attack throughout history, is not a new one. In fact, another one of the victims to this attack and the team to first announce the discovery of the hack was, first, was, was FireEye. And in their report to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as part of the United States Resiliency Project, warned of just this set of concerns. In cybersecurity, it's often not enough to have your own house in order. As targets or organizations improve their security posture, attackers will compromise less mature companies who can then be used as entry points to their real enterprise targets. And that's precisely what the SolarWinds Sunburst attack represents. Attackers could access SolarWinds build system, where SolarWinds created the various packages that they distributed to customers, 
Those customers relied on the software that they produced, installed that software with expansive permission across their fleets, and accepted updates directly from SolarWinds. But for months, those updates were controlled by the attackers, giving them administrative access to machines across various government agencies and untold other enterprises. And we've said this attack was not a full-scale assault. It was calculated and slowly exploited. Given the manual way that their CICD was configured, it was relatively easy for the attackers to influence the build process once they had accessed the build infrastructure. These builds were done on a set of machines and then signed with SolarWinds electronic signatures. But since the attackers had taken control of the VMs, they were able to inject any malicious code they wanted directly into the build pipeline. Now, at first, they just tested this capability to see if they would be detected. A few months later, they decided to release the real payload, Sunburst, which took the Orion software and trojanized it, allowing the attackers to monitor and attach to any system that the infected Orion update was loaded onto. From there, the attackers would deploy a third type of malware called Teardrop that was installed via the back door that Sunburst had opened for them. Of course, this practice of using dedicated VMs for the build and certification process isn't unique to SolarWinds. And as the CEO of SolarWinds aptly pointed out, they're not the only vulnerable party here. Many other enterprises and software companies use similar build processes and would be susceptible to similar attacks against their CI CD infrastructure. In some ways, though, that's exactly what I want to talk about today because there are a lot of dependencies that exist in our code. Sure, most of us, you know, when we hear dependency, think of that traditional open source dependency, a library I bring into my code to help me do a known set of things. It might help me access a specific type of database, interact with a known API, or control a particular device. Libraries may allow me to use the language that I'm programming in for a more specific purpose. And the use of dependencies is universal across software engineering. But what is a dependency? <laughs> what do I mean when I say that? Because I want to be very specific here that when I say dependency, what I mean uh, you know, is, is a very specific definition. And dependency is easily the most used word in this talk. So let's, let's talk about that. Again, one of the most obvious things it can mean, and it's part of what I defined it as too, is an open source dependency. Those are the libraries we're familiar with that in theory help us move faster to the end goal of solving a problem with our software. I'm not telling you anything you don't know already when I say that this type of dependency is everywhere. Data from GitHub's State of the Octaverse report shows just how rampant open source dependencies really are. And that's just direct dependencies called out in a package manager file as specific dependencies that a developer made a conscious decision to include in the project. But there are often a web of dependencies that come with those dependencies. Much like Inception, open source libraries bring their own dependencies along with them. Here, we see the transitive dependencies mapped by programming language, again, compared with direct dependencies on average for each project. As someone who programs in Node from time to time, I can attest that that line above JavaScript, it's real. Just come look at one of my Node modules folders sometime. There are a lot of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies listed in there. Okay. So that makes sense. There's the code we write and the open source libraries that we include in that code. Not much is new there. Many of us have seen that pattern before. But it's not just those libraries. It's also other third party libraries we bring in. And those may be closed source, you know, ones we're using to access the operating system or ones from another vendor for using their API. That library would then be a dependency as well. And then, of course, both of those pieces of software probably have dependencies of their own. Other open or closed source libraries that are packaged into the software that we're actually using. That's how LeftPad being removed from the NPM repository all of a sudden impacts basically everyone trying to build and deploy a Node app. They didn't add LeftPad necessarily to their package.json file so that they could pad some strings in their own application. But instead, the libraries they were using for something like you know, like Ajax HTTP requests or logging information, those used LeftPad. 
and thus the supply chain fell apart. But that's just the code. That's a part of the code that we ship. What about how we ship it? Well, the DevOps process and how we handle that are also part of what we depend on to get code into production. Are the systems we build on the same ones that have the rights to manipulate the production environment? What if those systems were compromised? Would it maybe be better to separate build and test functionality from the deployment methodology or the packaging of our code for our customers? And then there's the production environment itself. Where are we deploying the binaries that get created? How are customers accessing them? Who or what do we depend on to keep those systems running? Well, <laughs> it's a lot more third parties. Vendors for our CI CD stack, for our production environment, and then those vendors use other libraries, some of it open source, probably most of it closed source. We might bring in third or fourth party plugins or actions that are written to work with our CI CD infrastructure, but are written by some other unknown person or group. And all of these things purport to help us build code faster, ship to production sooner, and make our customers happy. But if we're not sure that we can do it securely, are we sure we're not the next group to fall victim to the kind of attacks we talked about? What really are our dependencies? Well, that's why I want to introduce or maybe refresh and define this concept of a software supply chain. The sum total of all of these dependencies is better defined as a supply chain. It makes it clear we're not only talking about the dependencies in the strict software sense of the world. We're talking about something a bit more complex. So, okay, you say it's, it's more complex, Brendan. Well, then what is it? I, I understand... A supply chain, when it, it comes to manufacturing, you have a supplier of raw materials, and then you turn that into a finished product. But when it comes to software, how do we define a single supply chain? Well, for the purpose of discussion today, I'd like to propose that your software supply chain is the sum total of anything involved in getting your code into a production environment. Anything more restrictive than that definition and we leave ourselves open to the ability to overlook important or critical aspects of software production. So we talked about some of what that includes. It includes, of course, our code, but also how is it created? How secure are the endpoints that our developers are using? It also, of course, includes all the open source dependencies our code has, and we went through that in detail. But again, what about the code that comes from other sources we're not thinking about? Packages in the operating system that we rely on or those from a hardware vendor, or firmware on the hardware that we're using, those are all aspects of our supply chain. And then often neglected are our DevOps and CI/CD processes. Where is the code built? Is that in a clean environment each time or a reused one? Where do we store the artifacts of the build? Is that in yet another system? And if so, what are the security permissions on each system that the code must pass through in order to get to production? Outside of that, are we bringing in other snippets of code into our CICD process? What other things are we depending on that we don't have direct control over? And then there's the environment. In many environments, the production system that the company runs are highly protected, and rightly so. If an attacker were to get direct access to an application or a database server, that would be extremely undesirable, to say the least. But once you've embraced the concept of a supply chain, then what really constitutes your production environment? What else should be guarded as we guard the systems that the production application runs on? Well, really anyone and any system that has access to production to manipulate it by virtue of that can impact production, right? If we're storing the root certificate that we use to sign our software, on our same pet build server, which is exposed to the world, well, that server is just as much production system as our you know, credit card processing database. And then really our, our developers and their systems part of production? Well, it depends on the safeguards you have in place and how your DevOps platform works, either you know, looking at an intentional insider threat or maybe even a seemingly innocent security change. How your DevOps platform works and how you get code from developers' laptops to the systems that then have access to your production systems, that's part of the production chain. And as is the rest of the supply chain we just talked about, 
The security along that entire process impacts the security we're able to deliver to the application as a whole. So let's say you're on board. You, your eyes have been opened and you see how wide the software supply chain really is. You can see links that are weaker than others most of the time. And you even have a few links in your company's supply chain that you know are weak already. Now what? How can we identify and mitigate these risks? Well, I think the first step is to identify all of them. In the same sense that, you know, what is measured can be improved. You have to first know what your supply chain is before you can hope to protect it. Because if you leave something out at this phase and it's the weak link, then all of the other work you do with the other links in the chain will be wasted. Once you have a decent understanding, you need to set up proactive management of those dependencies moving forward. This cannot be an activity that just happens once, tightens up your boundaries and security, and then slowly degrades over time to the same state it's in now. And most importantly, you want to automate as much as possible. Understanding quickly where any known issue that arises might impact your particular supply chain is one of the most critical aspects of supply chain security. In our, in GitLab's uh, DevSecOps survey for 2021, we found interesting information about how teams have matured application security over the past few years. Even as over 70% of security professionals report that their teams have shifted left, that is moved security earlier in the development process. But if you dig deeper, some curious dichotomies surface. Scanning certainly increased. We saw jumps of 10, 20, 30 percentage points year over year in teams scanning different parts of their code and their supply chain. Today, 53% of developers run SAS scans, 44% run, percent run DASH scans, uh, dynamic code analysis, and 50% of security professionals report that they scan containers, run dependency scans, and do license compliance checks. But while there are more scans run, most results aren't easily available. Only 14% of respondents say that they make scans available to their developers. Even the static code analysis that runs on the developer's own code isn't always available at the time that the developers are deciding to integrate that code together. That can leave a lot of that gaps. In fact, the typical vulnerability goes undetected for four years. From the time it's identified until the time teams have actually passed their code, that's typically another two to three months. That is all time that attackers have a surface to attack your supply chain. So shortening the length of time from an issue being identified to it being resolved is one of the most productive things your team can do to secure your supply chain. But what about the four years that it's undetected? Or even a best case scenario, a few weeks or months? Well, for that, I'm recommending what I'm calling supply chain defense in depth. For those who might not be familiar, defense in depth is a concept in cybersecurity and security in general where you layer multiple defenses so that if one method of security controls is compromised or one vulnerability exploited, you can limit the impact and stop the attacker with other means. For many organizations, this type of security is going to be a journey. In less mature organizations, even the idea of supply chain security, much less a defense and depth strategy, can seem kind of far-fetched. But as an organization matures, they'll have the ability to look more externally. And I believe that every organization, mature or not, can take proactive steps on each of these fronts that I've drawn here. Two basic types of vulnerabilities, known and unknown, and then those that are internal to what we're building or external dependencies that we're using to build our code. For each square in this matrix, we can have a plan in place for how we're going to identify and mitigate those threats. And how you know we handle each of these really could be a talk in itself, right? Zero trust is something you hear about. It's a relatively mature pattern, but it's one that we're going to see expand over the coming years. And you know, even if you're not there yet, I think everyone should be able to expect their suppliers to produce, you know, a software bill of materials so you can understand the dependencies you're bringing in. As you think through your security posture, figure out what, you know, where it lands on this grid and identify your weakest spot and start there. Now, that can be kind of intimidating. So, where can you start today? How can you leave this talk and make your organization less susceptible to supply chain attacks? Well, I think the first key is to understand your supply chain. If your team doesn't already have a clear diagram or map of those dependencies, start by drawing your own. And then publish it to the team. Don't worry about it being perfect or or complete. Just get it out there. Once it's written down, it's much easier to iterate on. And then make sure that you understand all of the direct and transient dependencies involved in your environment and in production proper, 
but also in the infrastructure involved in getting code to production. And it's been said before, but making security a key part of your development process is also critical to ensuring that you have repeatable security where you can add protection and layers to make sure that all the links in your change, chain are considered. And of course, this is an ongoing process. It's not something that you just do once and then you're, you're done. It's going to be uh, an ongoing process where you have to establish kind of a method of always revisiting the plan and making sure that it's up to date. Thank you so much for your time today. Again, if nothing else, I hope you've thought of at least a few links in your chain that uh, you hadn't maybe considered before. And while no one can ensure that all of our dependencies are you know, security hole free or perfect, we can work to make understand where our chain is the weakest and put reinforcements and depth of defenses there to help our organizations succeed. Thanks and stay safe.